I just want to offer a little bit more clarity around these human capital bonds and the, the financial structure so that people can sort of, because I think that is a central concept that people need to understand. And they change up the terms for it sometimes. Um, so it makes it hard to pin down because they'll say, oh, it's not a social impact bond, it's pay for success, or it's not pay for success, it's a social impact partnership, or you know, they'll continue to change the words. But essentially the, the premise of this human capital financial system that's moving forward is that there are equations that are used to cost out sort of negative externalities. And there are, um, academic institutions often will be brought in to create these equations, these think tanks, to determine your return on investment. And so they cost out, you know, what does it cost if you're incarcerated? And, and, and in many respects, growing the levels of incarceration and documenting the cost of incarceration are really going to feed into these impact markets because that's going to be a giant cost offset. What is the cost of providing special education? What is the cost of someone having depression and not being able to work? Everything, all of these human elements or social or policy programs are going to have money attached to them. And then the premise is that if you can preemptively fix someone, and this may be that the person hasn't even ended up in that situation. They may have never been incarcerated. They may have never actually been diagnosed with depression. They may never have um, you know, been identified as needing special education. But if you profile them into their potentiality of that, right? it's almost like a pre-crime scenario, you can preemptively fix them from something that may have never happened and generate a cost offset. Because you would say, you know, it's going to cost us X thousands of dollars to fix you if you've been broken. It'll cost us only a fraction of that to fix you preemptively so that doesn't happen. And, and the space in between will negotiate our profit, and that's the profit that will be taken by these um, investment entities. So I just want to make it clear that the, this, the history of this structure goes back much farther than I initially thought. Um, I had originally thought that um, this started with social impact bonds, which came out of um, the United Kingdom, and Sir Ronald Cohen developed them in, I think, about 2010. And the first one was the Peterborough Social Impact Bond, which was a prison bond. And that was early on. And then several years later, I think in 2012, that concept was brought over from the UK to the US. And the first social impact bond here was Rikers Island, which was another prison um, social impact bond to ostensibly provide services so that people wouldn't end up back in prison. And again, even within that concept, you have to understand that um, that's not looking at the structural nature of incarceration, that, that being incarcerated is, is essentially something that is the problem of the person as a problem, opposed to a problem of a social system. Um, so I had thought it started with social impact bonds in this sort of 2010 era. I found out later that actually the government performance contracting system was much earlier and actually started in the mid 1990s. And this was happened in the Twin Cities area which wasn't any place, there's sort of a geography to this. There's this idea of you know, New York as hedge funds and DC as policy and Silicon Valley as tech and entertainment and, and, and different, you know, Boston as venture capital, these different cities that have different, Chicago as futures markets, different cities. Twin Cities was not on my radar at all. Um, but it turns out that the Twin Cities is also where charter schools started and it was right around the same time. And the Minneapolis Federal Reserve, there was an economist there, his name is Arthur Rolnick. So Arthur Rolnick, and also a, a gentleman by the name of Stephen Rothschild, who was a former executive at General Mills, who had started a um, sort of work-ready program for um, you know, at-risk adult men in that area, um, got together and created in the mid-1990s a prototype for performance-based contracting for the government. Um, and for the, the for for Minnesota, and that was the very earliest structure upon which all of these pay for success contracts now have been layered on top of. So that's important to understand that it goes back to the Federal Reserve research early on, and that Stephen Rothschild was connected with um, Clayton Christensen. So this idea of disruptive um, innovation, and it goes back to this early stage. And it's important because. Um, one of the major players in this space, in the development 
um, and use of philanthropy to catalyze social impact finance and human capital data analytics is coming out of Silicon Valley. And the Silicon Valley Community Foundation is the largest community foundation um, in the country, if, if not the world, I, definitely in the United States. And it, and it cycles lots of tech money and a lot of that is actually also in cryptocurrency. So there, it's a huge behemoth and it's sort of a, you know, a slush fund. The money goes in and it sort of mixes around and then it can come out and it makes it harder to track what money is coming from whom and undertaking which programs. But that is a central feature. And it was created um, by combining two large pre-existing foundations in the Bay Area to make this community foundation. And the first director, his name was Emmett Carson, and he came out of the Minneapolis area um, to come and run. And, and then in 2012, in this um, Santa Clara area, which is a pilot for a lot of pay for success, they actually brought in Stephen Rothschild to talk about this model of performance-based contracting. So within the geography of how these innovative systems of finance work, it's important to understand the role of Art Rolnick and Minneapolis, because Art Rolnick later ended up partnering with several important individuals on something called the Invest in Kids Working Group. And if you're going to create a human capital market, you want to maximize, and it's based on human capital data, you want to maximize the amount of data you collect. Um, so their framework is that they would emphasize on early childhood education because that's starting early. Actually, it, at this point, they're actually backing up into prenatal and home visits for pregnant mothers. So that's about as early as you can get in terms of like conception to get the data. So it, it's backed up even further, but there's a, a profound focus well, on- Well, sperm, I mean, that's- yeah. <laughs> But the being, um, it's these home visits which are showing up all over the place, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But early childhood and pre-K um, is a focus. And I think also, if you can start to shape the mindset of that generation, knowing that many of the timeframes for these larger transform systems transformations are projected at 2030, 2035. These pre-K kids now are going to be the adults of that future and you need to groom them in that model. You need to bring them along from the earliest age. So this Invest in Kids Working Group was a connection of Ar Arthur Rolnick from the Minneapolis Federal Reserve, he was the econ research economist, Jim Heckman, who I had mentioned previously at University of Chicago, Nobel Prize winning economist in human capital, um, and also Robert Duger. And Robert Duger was um, a manager of capital for Paul Tudor Jones, who's one of the largest hedge fund managers, um, Tudor Capital Investments, and he has his own funds. So we have to understand that these human capital investments are integral with not only capital, global capital markets, but specifically hedge fund markets. So in those hedge fund markets depend on movement of data, continual movement of data for the gambling and the betting and the derivatives. Um, it's not just venture capital that you're gonna put money into developing a company or a business over long-term patient capital. No, this is stuff that's moving constantly and that's why this idea of hooking people into Internet of Things sensors and devices and recalibrating your understanding of their value, their economic worth in real time is so important to this process pursuing. And it's a, it's a very grim and sort of brutal process. I mean, I don't want to in any respects say that, that I'm okay with this, but you have to understand the mechanics to understand why you have kindergarten children with clever badges and why you have pre-K kids on surveillance play tables. It really ultimately is both to serve the hedge fund markets and to train up these kids to live in these virtual environments, these coded worlds that are in the pipeline for the fourth industrial revolution circa 2030. Tell me about the Harlem Children's Fund. So the Harlem Children's Zone, um, that has been in place for like 30 years. And is this idea that there's this geographic zone in Harlem where sort of it became an area that private investors could invest in community-based services delivered to um, the residents of Harlem, many low-income residents, many black residents. Um, it involved privatization of their public schools, often through charter schools, but also wraparound social services supports. Um, which in many respects seems like a wonderful thing, right? But again, I would say it's being framed as a human capital market. So what the Harlem Children's Zone, it was backed by Stanley Druckenmiller, who was um, 
an, another hedge fund manager he worked closely he managed one of George Soros's um, funds uh, together they shorted the British pound for like a billion dollars <laughs> so that's the kind of work that they do and they're involved in this um, social welfare program in Harlem um, again over the course of three decades uh, Paul Tudor Jones who um, Robert Duger with the Invest in Kids Working Group had worked with for, for quite a number of years. Another hedge fund, this hedge fund trader, he had, his charity was called um, the Robin Hood Foundation. It is called the Robin Hood Foundation. And it is sort of one of the most sought after sort of peer groups of the hedge fund trader philanthropy community in New York. And every year he has a giant gala and Oprah Winfrey comes and all of the people come. And, um, you know, it's the place to be is in, in, is at the Robin Hood Foundation Gala. So the Robin Hood Foundation is pouring money along with Stanley Druckenmiller into the Harlem Children's Zone for these social welfare programs. What has come out of it over these decades of like studying these folks as sort of test subjects was a set of equations. It was a book that was like 168 pages long that had return on investments of different types of investments in poor people. So if you gave a poor child, a low income kid glasses, this was, the, this was your economic return. If you treated their parents addiction, this was the return. 168 pages of cost offsets based on investments. So essentially that is the manual that once this scales well beyond the Harlem Children's Zone, in order for these hedge funds to play the game, the rules have to be clear. There have to be a clear understanding of what the returns are and what the metrics are and the every, it's all agreed upon. If, if the rules aren't clear, they, no one's going to play the game. Right? and they need the game to go on. So all of these systems were put in place to standardize the terms of the game. Now, Jeffrey Canada led the Harlem Children's Zone, and it's interesting because um, Canada and Stanley Druckenmiller were both at Bowdoin at the same time in Maine, um, small school. And so they were very tightly connected. Now, Canada has since sort of stepped back from the Harlem Children's Zone, but is working on consulting, and is consulting um, in Promise Zone neighborhoods that have been laid out in federal um, legislation as sort of these investment zones all over the country. And that these promise zones and also later opportunity zones um, have been set up to accept this sort of private investment um, in human capital. But we have to understand that all of this human capital as something that is quantifies people as data and essentially values people um, merely for their perceived contribution to an economy that is increasingly run by robots and doesn't need people, right? So it's a very twisted system of how we're both profiling people, controlling people through the data, all of which is framed as a caring service provi providing role when really it is not empowering to the people, it is very paternal, pater like controlling of the people because for the most part there's not a lot of choice made in how they operate within these investment systems they're just acted upon mm -hmm. and so it's just i think within this historic perspective there's a reason why this happens in harlem right it's there, there there's a very specific reason certain communities are targeted for these interventions and to believe that these hedge fund managers, including Paul Tudor Jones, who got his start in cotton futures specifically, you have to understand it within a continuum of history to, to make sense of it. Um, the other piece is that I had mentioned home visit legislation. South Carolina is uh, the pilot project for this um, nurse family partnership home visit program uh, tied to pay for success finance also. Um, as part of this package, and this is partnered with South Carolina Medicaid, um, they were slipping in this app. It was a behavior tracking app called Goal Mama. And this app was actually developed by the wife of Pierre Omidyar. Pierre Omidyar developed eBay. And she has like a patient compliance neuro research gamification program going on. And so they developed this app and it was sort of, you know, pitched as they would solve poverty because all you need to solve poverty is a nudge, a digital nudge at the right time to make you make the right choice, right? It's not looking at structural analysis, it's merely imposing from the outside these coercive digital measures on vulnerable communities. And this was embedded in the Nurse Family Partnership Program um, in South Carolina. So again, South Carolina, like a center of, you know, 
black resistance to slavery. Like there's a reason why these different geographies are targeted and there's historic overlays to that. Um, these home visit, le there's a significant home visit legislation that's happening all over the country now that's being pushed really hard, including like having people in the homes of women like a few days after childbirth. And the question is to what end? Is it, is it to get this predictive analytics data for these investment programs? Um, can people refuse these programs? Is it going to come with a digital identity system for these children? Because the state of Illinois has actually piloted blockchain birth certificates um, with Evernim, which is a Salt Lake City um, based company. So they're talking about blockchain birth certificate programs already. Um, and then what how do we extract from this? How do we keep our families and our kids out of this data analytic systems? Um, you know, and I will say this is it's a challenge because I, I come at this from from a, a more left leaning side. The people that have been the strongest confronting these overreach and these home visits have been conservatives um, and, and, very, and many mothers and very well organized. And for that, like, I'm, I'm very grateful for them to stop this overreach. I mean, it would be one thing if these programs were voluntary that you chose to do them. It would be another thing if it wasn't involving pay for success be another thing if it wasn't involving coercive apps that would track people's behaviors. And I think increasingly now with the contact tracing and these health status check-ins and QR codes, people are being more conscious about how these phones, these inter in, in ICT, individual communication technology devices are being used to, um, in very prescriptive ways, in ways that begin to confine people and control people. Um, we need to be having really robust conversations about what's going on here because um, children are, you know, I have this banner that I keep taking out with me. I'm like, children are not impact investment commodities. They're not data commodities. They're not, they're children. And, and I think at a very fundamental level across political spectrums, like we should be protecting our children from the, these systems, all of our children, like, and not just like my child, but like we should be standing up with the people who are most at risk. Um, in these situations. And I think there's a lot of concern within the context of this, the pandemic dialogue of family removal, family separation, you know, a lot of uncertainty about how this is actually going to play out. But I think, you know, this will disproportionately impact frontline workers, workers in care industries, many of those precarious workers, people who, who are black and brown indigenous folks who are gonna be at risk on the front lines and how do we um, protect their families, their family units. Um, that's really important to think about. So it's, it's kind of the intersection of these two things. If you're talking this, these investment markets, mm -hmm. everything is about virtualizing life in social relations and uploading it as data on a dashboard. And we, it's very important to understand that these dashboard entities, like who they are, like who, who is creating the dashboards that, that are gonna run our lives. A big force in this is Salesforce and Mark Benioff. So he's a big person that's backing these data dashboards. Um, also, um, Microsoft and Balmer, they have these social suite, social solutions that are going to, if you're gonna do these performance-based government, social welfare, privatized welfare contracts, you need them on a dashboard. And so when you hear gap, essentially a gap means you're gonna take someone's data from this point and try to close it, right? Like that's how these performance contracts work. You'll say, look, if you close the gap, we'll pay you. You know, if you get the gap closed to this amount, we'll pay you this much. You close it to this amount, we'll pay you this much. So it's, it's, a, it's a way of engineering humans and communities on dashboards. And once you create a global market around poverty management, around gap closing, you really have no incentive to stop the gap. <laughs> like once the gap is closed, the game is done. Like we're just done with the game. The gap can never close. So the gap can shrink and expand and be managed and moderated. And if you understand that the investors in this are hedge fund investors, some of whom will likely, that the debt on these, this privatized social welfare will be securitized and that there will be people who are actually shorting these deals. So there will be people betting that the deals work, that the interventions work, but there may also be people buying the debt, betting it won't work, right? And so, and that totally undermines this idea that we're only paying if things work. Once you securitize the debt and people are betting against it, 
it's the whole thing. Like it's just, it's a catastrophe, right? Um, but the idea of dashboards and gaps are critical. They will never eliminate the source of their market. It's not logical to think that the hedge, global hedge funds would create a system that would ultimately stop their market. If it's profitable, you will grow that market. That's just how it is. That's the logic of the market. If it's profitable, you will create more poverty that's managed. That's just how it is. We're a city of high poverty. I'm in Philadelphia. Right. So we're identified and we actually have been specifically called out like the, the um, Philadelphia Economy League wrote a white paper in 2016 saying that we're gonna be the impact economy. Like we are so great because we have a lot of poverty. We have a lot of people who love innovative finance and a lot of rich people. And you know what, like if you've got a lot of something, how do you make money on it? So they're gonna make money on poverty with pay for success finance. And that's, and you know, when I talk about metrics, there's this metrics books that's connected to the Robinhood Foundation, but there's other ones too. So the, um, a lot of these programs run on public-private partnerships. That public-private partnership model is instrumental in the pay-for-success piece. Um, and because that's the outsourcing, that's to say like, oh, we, government doesn't have it to pay for itself, but we'll outsource it and we'll just pay if it works. Um, there are going to be these new companies that will be these hybrid corporate for the public good. They're called benefit corporations. And some of them are out there and they're like warm and fuzzy like Ben and Jerry's and you know they'll sell you like shade grown coffee and fair trade textiles and like they're framing it as sustainable development. Um, these benefit corporations that are, are, are checked off like on the boxes of like being good corporations and get these certifications. But really these benefit corporations are gonna be used for these privatized partnerships. And a lot of the charter schools in California are registered as B Corps. Um, the B Lab was funded by the Rockefeller Foundation. It's out in Berwyn, out on the main line. And they've done their own metrics. So they've set all of their own rules about how things will run with educational technology and the, the success metrics that'll go along with that. And that keeps the rules of the game clean and going. Um, so Philadelphia has a new poverty committee. It rolled out last year to manage our poverty for profit. Um, and I've, I testified several times, both on education and on housing, about the problem that we have regional workforce development plans that are in place now that say, of the top 12 high growth positions in the state of Southeast, or the part of Southeastern Pennsylvania um, in our region, only two of those jobs were paying, like, there was a $30 an hour job and a $50 an hour job. Those were managerial class and everybody else was like 15, 12, 10, and eight. And, and they're talking poverty, but they're not talking about the gig economy. They're like, oh, maybe we should talk about the gig economy. Like it never occurred to the city council people after multiple public hearings that like they actually need to be talking about the gig economy, that you couldn't talk about how homelessness without also talking about the fact that our workforce plan says a vast majority of people are making 10 bucks an hour. Like, so to me that indicates that there is never an intention for people to be economically independent. That they intend for people to work at Walmart and McDonald's and at these subpar wages and then maybe get this UBI surplus to try to scrape by. But they will never be independent. And a piece of that that's part of this poverty committee is something called the Benefits Data Trust. Um, and it's in several states and I'd have to refresh my memory about it, but it is about sort of connecting people with benefit systems. And that, that is what I would say is like my thought process has changed. When you understand social welfare as a human capital impact market that's being run by big data and big finance, suddenly this idea of the government taking care of people becomes a lot more sinister if the taking care of part involves apps on your phone and tracking and biometrics and putting your snap on blockchain. It's a very different thing than we were led to believe growing up. And so at, will we stand down and, and, and just cede all of the autonomy of people to make their own way, like to have their own path and to support each other in that? And, and I, I think the world that we need is a world where this wealth that is locked up in these small numbers of people in this transnational global capital has to get come down, redistributed. And it, it, can, it should not be redistributed through these impact investing schemes because that's incredibly predatory. And again, the data that's coming off of all of this is feeding into AI. And, and I, I, I think that's a terrible thing. That's coming through um, 
IXO Foundation based in Switzerland is part of this, um, these blockchain identity systems, and they intend to feed the Internet of Things data that's tied to the human capital analytics into something called Ocean Protocol that will be used specifically to build AI. So like they're mining poor people for data to build the singularity. And like no one's going to get it until it's too late. <laughs> it's just. Can people opt out then? Well, so I, I mean, I think our question is, and this is this was my struggle in education. I kept thinking like, okay, so I refuse Google Classroom for my child. Like, you know, I was probably one of the only people in Philadelphia who didn't do use Google Classroom. It was pain for, and my kid was very accommodating for that. But it was difficult, right? They want you to do the thing, but we could still do that. They managed to make it out before we turned education into a series of stackable badges, which is what's coming with this learning ecosystem model. Great. Um, what happens if you, and, and the thing with this pay for success finance and learning ecosystem model is we have to understand that the voucher, like the SNAP voucher, that's going to be your education voucher. And they're going to say like, oh, you can be a free market person and buy your own education. You can make all the best choices with your voucher to buy whatever you want. But really most of the stuff you're going to be able to buy is like cheap, terrible online curriculum. Um, and navigating that, the rich will be able to supplement those vouchers with their own money and the poor will be stuck doing work-based learning in very difficult work, work situations, I believe. And, and then the, the you know, entitled kids will get to work at law firms and stockbroking houses or whatever. Like That's how it's going to go. Um, but once they have these vouchers, they will be coming after the homeschool kids and the unschool kids because the library will be issuing badges and the community theater will be issuing badges. And they will be sending the data back because they're going to get paid back off of these pay for success contracts too. So all of the things that homeschool, like traditional homeschool and unschool families had access to will get co-opted. So okay, so say we just step outside of all of that and we build a whole parallel education system that doesn't take the vouchers, that's completely independent. Okay, well then your child gets to be 18 and has no badges. In a world that demands badges. Like, oh, you know. Every kid that graduates, you know, maybe, you know, in 10 years, everyone graduates with 200 badges. Well, you've got the unschool, like, the hardcore unschool kid who has no badges. Where do they go? When, when a global economy is increasingly mediated through AI, human, cap, human resource stuff. Um, so we have to build a whole new thing. I mean, and I'm not saying any of this is easy, but what I, I feel like in this world that's coming, there will, be a, there will be the tiny bit of billionaires. There will be a cohort of people who are the data analysts that run the dashboards and manage the people who run the dashboards. And they will be essentially oppressing people. Like their job will be to manage the oppression. And then there will be everybody else who will be the oppressed. And like I don't, as a parent, want to aspire for my kid to like succeed by being in a position to be the oppressor. Like, I mean, and, and, and I don't mean to say that we haven't always lived in a situation where people of privilege have, have been in positions of, of enacting certain levels of oppression. But it will be increasingly brutal and increasingly automated. And I think the mental health impact of that on everyone is going to be devastating. So I'm just trying to think through how do we build a world with no badges, with real knowledge, with reciprocity in which the resources of the earth and the community are shared in ways that support hu humane relationships. You know, and, and that's, a, I know that's a tall order. Maybe humans are not that good at that. Maybe I should just like throw it in with the robots. But like, I don't want to be with the robots right now. I'm like still resisting. <laughs> how does, how do people get paid then? So I'm an investor. I invest in, in these, this social impact. Where does that money come from to pay me back plus m my profit? Well, so for now, for the moment, and this is all sort of fictitious capital, right? So it's kind of like they're just making shit up. <laughs> but is that the government will agree not to pay for the services straight out, but only pay for the services if they work, okay? So this is this government performance piece that they'll somehow come up with the money if you can guarantee hitting the data mark that you have to hit so that your kids in online pre-K get a certain score. <laughs> you know, or your kids, that, that that's how it's structured. Um, like clearly, if the rich people are not paying their taxes 
and the poor people can't pay taxes, like eventually the government will t start to like not even be able to do that at all, which is interesting. So then there's another form of innovative finance, which is the next generation that's being called the impact security, which is piloted um, by these two women, one of whom is an Wharton alumna. Um, and they have piloted this concept where, how do I say it? So an investor can invest in an evidence-based program with a performance-based contract in a nonprofit. And if they achieve it, they can be paid back by a foundation. So in the, in the impact security premise, the government isn't really involved at all. And so in this case, if you realize that the corporations, many of whom say the technology corporations, have parallel foundations, you essentially create the human capital battery system. So say, for example, you have Hewlett Packard and Hewlett Packard decides, and this is all just conceptual at this point, to invest in a pre early childhood education intervention that's predicated on data where the pre-K people use Hewlett Packard tablets, products, devices, wearable technology, brainwave headbands, whatever, to get the data. And then they manage to engineer to hit the targets to make the pre-K kids jump through the hoops to get the number that they need to get. And then they're paid back by the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. And that, you know what I mean? And so, and you could have the Dell Corporation and the Michael Dell Foundation. You can have Microsoft and the Gates Foundation. Like you can have any of these technology companies on the one hand are making this investment and paying each other back. So they're just circulating their corporate capital and their philanthropic capital round and round and round. And the people are caught in the middle making the data. Now has this, so the impact security right now, the one, the, the case they've piloted it in, um, San Quentin Prison, and it's framed as um, job training, doing coding for incarcerated people. And they say, oh, look, we're doing this great. We're training um, people who are incarcerated to become coders, and they'll get good wages, and we're paying them more than we would pay, they would get paid otherwise doing other types of prison-based labor. So it's a win-win. It's a um, but the impact metric for that security to be met isn't that when upon release those individuals get a stable job in the tech industry like that's not the success metric the success metric for the deal is a certain number of hours worked right so that's what i'm saying when you structure these deals you can structure them in ways that you can define success in the terms that work for the investor not for the person who's caught in the deal and for the most times, the people who are caught in the deal are people with very little power when they're individual and isolated. And you mentioned that they, there could be a, a situation where secondary and uh, other markets could be created where they're actually selling these investments yeah. between each other as well. Is that correct? Yeah. So, so there's another, and this is still incipient, right? Like, so some of these, there are actual proofs of concept. Some of them are sort of piloted out on paper. Um, there's a platform called Alice SI that's based out of the United Kingdom. That's a blockchain investment program in human capital where I think ultimately the idea is that, speaking of which, you don't necessarily need a government investment. You might not even need a corporate investment. You could just have a rich person investing in a poor person. Okay, And this would be done on blockchain. Um, and that there would be tokens and this is another way of using these tokens to demonstrate compliance and performance and gamification. And that um, the tokens in this, there's a white paper from this Alice SI platform that talks about securitizing secondary markets for these tokens, these investments in poverty interventions, evidence-based poverty interventions. So they are specifically talking about developing secondary securitized markets on that tokenized debt. I don't know at this point if they have actually done securitization on that yet, but definitely they're trying to figure out how to do it. And the, the other piece I want to mention is ter in terms of a proof of concept that is troubling. So I had mentioned IXO Foundation was backing amply this pre-K blockchain identity system um, that was tied to attendance and, and um, payments to people based on pre-K attendance in, South, in Cape Town. 
IXO Foundation hosted a bunch of impact investors and blockchain people um, about a year or so ago, and they developed sort of these new you know, partnerships. And one of the partnerships they developed was with something called IO2 Foundation, or also it goes by Shanzai City. And it's based out of Hong Kong. And the, the, the guy who's in charge of that was educated in Hong Kong and at Columbia University and London School of Economics. So these are very much global players. Um, what that partner, what's come out of that partnership is actually a way of triggering impact tokens for poverty management programs using video, um, facial recognition video in people's homes. So in this case, I had mentioned these um, home visit programs um, are the, 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 like the pregnant mother programs, the Goal Mama app. I had mentioned home visit programs. Well, now you add in a tablet that can take video and you have social impact interveners coming into people's homes with a tablet that enables video taking and facial recognition on this tablet that would enact um, blockchain payments if you could prove that the intervention was successful in whatever that way that was. Like, I don't know if the child needs to perform some task in front of you. Like, I don't know if you're document. I don't know what, they have a number of papers that talk about how this, this is called like last mile verification on blockchain. Um, but so they are essentially mixing the sort of innovative finance Swiss banking model with sort of cutting edge AI, blockchain facial recognition work coming out of Asia. Um, and so when I talk about this as, this is not a Democrat or Republican thing, this is not a national thing. I mean, it does involve empire and US like finance, but it is a global enterprise that we're looking at and that what we need is to understand these models and that any model once it's secured and becomes socially normalized um, can be anywhere very rapidly, especially since it's all connected to the sustainable development goals and often operating through UNICEF. Because actually that, that pilot program was happening in China, but also in Brazil, in Boa Vista, which was tied to this um, Bolsa Familia um, sub family subsidy for low-income families in Brazil. They, they were using the same technology, this facial recognition technology, in people's homes. Um, so people very much are becoming the batteries of these systems. And I think there are many people in blockchain spaces who think of this as liberated, liber, <laughs> like liberatory technology. But you tie it to Swiss banking and you tie it to facial recognition and you get in people's homes and you threaten people like potentially with compliance or family separation and, and, and social service programs that are operating at the behest of the state and corporations. And, and, and there are very, very many ways that can go wrong. And we need to be very, very conscious. Um, and, and we need to stand in solidarity globally because it's coming after all of us. What are some scenarios, like, can you give me some, some, some scenarios where this would uh, go south? <laughs> like, uh, to flesh it out, like, yeah. uh, to get people's, because a lot of this just seems kind of abstract for, it's going to feel a lot of abstract for people to, but if you can give, like, a, like, okay, imagine this happens, and then this happens. This is, this is, this is a scenario that could take place because of this, this arrangement, you know? Yeah, so, um, so a lot of the, 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 what's useful around this is understanding the language. So they'll talk about pathways and like continuum of care and that you're placed in a program and you're, con you're, you're, you're not, you just have to stay on the pathway that someone gives you. So say you are, um, an unhoused person and you're put in a job training program, right? And you're given a smartphone to track your progress on your pathway. And there's an investor in this work training program. This it's, it's, it's a social impact pay for success work training program. And you're supposed to clock in and out of your program with a QR code on your phone. And you have a health crisis or something, you know, that, that precludes you from participating. But many of these systems become automated and there's not actually a person that you can talk to, a case manager, like may just be an avatar to like stop the systems in place. So you don't, you're not able to check in because you broke your leg and you're in the, you're, you're in a coma or something like that. And then essentially if you do not 
follow these automated procedures, you get cut off, like your benefits are wiped. And so like when you get out, like you can't get back in the system. Um, you know, I talked about the, the, the surveillance play tables with the kids, like those are blockchain enabled, like that, that will be part of this blockchain identity, I believe. Um, there are things that are, I think, going to be coming out of the, this uh, the disease situation right now. Um, there's a lot of talk, or there was, around the issue of comorbidities and the impacts of people who had pre-existing conditions on having bad health outcomes. And I think we're very aware that um, black and brown communities, indigenous communities, have been hit very hard in terms of mortality in this. Um, there are many more co comorbidities because of multiple reasons, um, you know, intergenerational trauma, environmental racism, um, stress, um, not access to good food. Like there are many structural elements that, that lead people to have asthma, um, diabetes, different elements that impacts their ability to have good health um, that are often beyond their immediate control that are part of the environment in which they live and operate. Um, what I am seeing is an interest in connecting pay for success finance to medical um, documentation. And so they would have something called social prescribing. And we're hearing this now. And it sounds good, like, go to your doctor. They'll prescribe you some nature. You're a little depressed. We think you should get out for a hike. Um, you know, you're, you're, you're not, you know, you're, you know, your diabetes, your blood sugar levels are not great. We think you should, you should be doing some more walking. Um, maybe you're a little stressed, you should do some meditation. And all of these things might sound nice, but when they become impact markets tied to your digital identity, um, this idea that you would um, need to check in again with a QR, we're ending up in this QR code world, right? Um, you know, I work in a public garden space. All they need to do is put a QR code on the check-in sign and say, um, you, you're, your aunt gets put on a pay for success healthcare pathway that they're supposed to, you know, walk somewhere, like maybe we're a preferred provider um, where you have a QR code and you have to check in, but say something happens, you lose your housing and you can't get to the place to do the walk because you have to be at the agencies trying to figure out what happens next with your housing and you can't walk the things and then the time comes that you need to get a replacement of your shoes you know, or some durable healthcare equipment, and it comes up that you haven't been fulfilling your obligation on this pay for success social prescribing program. And that's, these are very real things that I think the technology exists right now to do them. The question is, are they acceptable? And, and my concern is that they take very real concerns around um, equity of health access and issues of um, social determinants of health. And they're actually weaponizing these for the hedge funds because now they're increasingly having wearable technology. They can put a sensor in your sneaker. They can give you the brainwave headband and check and see if you've been like meditating like you were supposed to. You're a veteran with post-traumatic stress disorder and Bank of America sends you a VR headset and they know if you haven't been wearing it, right? And understanding big pharma is moving into digital medicine. <laughs> I mean, there are many concerns about these power dynamics and what positions vulnerable people are put in when they're made that their basic ability to live in the world is conditioned on compliant behavior to things that may not be in their best interests. Uh, or may be impossible for them. Even if they were in their best interest, they may be just simply impossible to accomplish. They could say, well, those are, you know, yeah, the system's not going to be perfect, and there's going to be some pe you know, people that get falsely punished or whatever, uh, but those are kinks we'll work out of the system, but it, there seems, there's something like larger, like just the whole system itself, the idea that, you know, to, that we are no longer sovereign individuals that have like rights to privacy and freedom, that we are, we are basically subject to this in per impersonal, inhuman, system, uh, you know, that's what scares me. Is Well, and I think this idea of isolation too, I mean, and that's something we're living through in this moment is being disconnected from people, from community. Um, these systems 
rely on data extraction and, and fracture people, atomize people. They, they need people to be independent operators um, so that they can then enact these pathways on them. If you had mutual support, if there was mutual aid, if, the, if we could rely on each other, then this model wouldn't work. Like they, we would have alternatives to this model. And that's why I think that this, the, I, the concept of mutual aid is so important, like that social solidarity is important, not because not a paternalistic model, but one in which people come together as equals and in care, like in fundamental care for each other as human beings um, and care for the world around us and nurturing all of that. This, this is extractive and controlling and, and it's all based on money and, this, and, and, and control systems. It is systems engineering. It is human systems engineering. And that's what goes back to what Norbert Wiener realized that he had built and bought, is that literally they're turning us into robots as robots replace us with this ultimate goal of maybe having no human beings at all. Except maybe, you know, these billionaires that upload their consciousness to some thing, you know, like I, the Borg. I, you know, that's, it's a very twisted worldview. And I, I, you know, I firmly believe that sort of an, an eco-feminist, like earth-based, caring-based is the, is the counter to that. And that it is a worldview th situation. It's not like we're going to just tweak this and make sure that Goldman Sachs, you know, isn't for like you would have to stay on top of Goldman Sachs every damn day to make sure that they didn't tweak the equation to like better their bottom line at the expense of toddlers. Like that's just how this is, especially once you start to automate it, because the code will be built into optimizing it for Goldman Sachs, not for the toddlers. It's just that's how power works. But see, it's interesting. So you know, I, I mentioned about the um, the Jim Heckman. The Heckman equation said that they couldn't really change cognitive data, but they could manipulate um, character. And a lot of this has to do with, um, in school and education, what they call social emotional learning and stuff that sounds really good because we were like brutalized by the standardized testing regime. And we're like, no, well, like we care about the whole kid, not just reading and math scores. And so it sounded really good, but really when you understand that their goal is to structure behavior according to certain metrics that are found to be acceptable. Um, a lot of that social emotional learning is coming through, through something called CASEL, C-A-S-E-L. I'm trying to remember, it's like the Collaborative for Academic Social Emotional Learning. It's backed by the Novo Foundation, which is Warren, Peter Buffett, I believe Warren Buffett's son. So they're all into this character training, mind manipulation idea. And, you know, we, you know, and it, this stuff is embedded even in sort of beloved institutions. And like many people were really upset with me when I wrote about a, a program um, that Sesame Workshop is doing essentially with IBM. Um, the MacArthur Foundation gave um, $100 million to data mine Syrian refugee children using AI literacy tablets developed by IBM. And it was branded with Sesame Workshop. And I said, you know, this, and actually if you look into the history of Sesame Workshop, it's the first public-private partnership and it came out of MIT. <laughs> um, it's always been a function of this system of empire, really, but branded with furry Muppets. Um, and you start peeling back, and you're like, oh, like actually Sesame Ventures has a whole tech venture capital program. So these PBS Kids apps and these branded apps that are, are being pushed into the hands of two-year-olds right now are all part of this program and part of what, what Heckman is looking at um, to, to incentivize families to get their kids on these apps so that they can get the data to prove behavior change. Um, and it starts with this premise that there's something wrong with you that needs to be improved. Yeah. And so, you know, this is based in this interoperable data system. The pilot for this interoperable data system was again in, in San Jose, which is in the, the, the Silicon Valley area where these pilots are all taking place. And it's called Data Zone. And it was backed 
by the NSF initially, and then Mark Zuckerberg put a bunch of money into it. Also the pa uh, David and Lucille Packard Foundation. So that was the model. It's now expanded to I think three or 400,000 students in that school district. It feeds into something called the Silicon Valley Regional Data Trust, which is encompassing like mental health data, um, early childhood data, juvenile delinquency data, academic data, foster care data, all of this data. Because for them, data is the oil, right? And it's the predictive analytics. And, and Zuckerberg, Chan Zuckerberg, was backing the scaling of Silicon Valley Regional Data Trust with the um, National Interoperability Collaborative. And at this big launch, for this as the model, like that they were going to scale, and I think it will come out of these health passports, and it will be tied in with Medicaid, um, they had panel discussions with folks that were um, like juvenile court justices, but also David Hausler was there. And David Hausler was the person who oversaw getting the genomic sequencing on the internet, right? So to me, that indicates, like they said, oh, there was a lively panel discussion. This is in the press release for this event where they're launching the Silicon Valley Regional Data Trust. I'm like, why, if they are not incorporating genomic into the predictive profiling, was Hausler there? And it seems very clear to me that there will be a genomic component in some of these profiling systems, which very much there's connections to the Templeton Foundation and Angela Duckworth and things that, who, who's still advancing Francis Galton, that there are situations that could very easily veer into eugenics, especially as we're talking about synthetic biology and bioengineering and using school-based community health centers. Um, in a world, again, in which those in power feel like most human beings are redundant and that robots can do the work better, there are profound consequences and they're all very racialized and we, we have to be asking a lot more questions. Right. Genoa way. <laughs> um, yeah, it's hard for people to think like these people in power do not think like you and I. Like they just, they have a different way of looking at the world. I mean, that's what power does. You know, we probably would think differently if we had that much power. So the other piece of this I do want to mention, this is another equation. So there's all these different equations out there. So like Columbia University has equation about social emotional learning that has, I can't remember, like 11% return on investment. And there's the Heckman equation, which is the pre-K equation. So that's a 7 to 13% rate of return. And the thing about the 13%, 7 to 11, but if you add health impacts, it's 13. So what we're starting to see are smart playgrounds, if kids ever get to go back to the playground again, where you have QR codes and augmented reality and like literature activities to do on your phone at the playground so they can get the data for the health impacts. <laughs> for these deals, right? So everything has to be subsumed, like real life has to be integrated into the virtual world so the hedge funds can run their deals. Um, another equation that's really vitally important to understand is connected to um, ACEs, which is adverse childhood experiences. And um, there are metrics associated with that and this, the scoring. So this comes out of Kaiser Permanente. And I, I, I wanna say just very clearly, like I know that there are very clear direct health impacts of childhood trauma. You know, I know that it, it affects my own family. So I like, my question is, once you put that on a metric, it it's gets tied in with pay for success finance. And then you're scoring people. And it also has like genomic, genetic components and epigenetic trauma components. So it's very important because in California, um, Gavin Newsom is advancing screening for ACEs through Medicaid. And we have to understand the way in which um, gathering all of this predictive profiling tied to trauma scores and, and talking about what that means for this hedge fund market because for the market, in the sick logic of this market, intervening for people who are screened as having high trauma scores according to these Kaiser Permanente metrics has a very high profit rating because when you harm a child, the impacts cross many different areas. People are more at risk of addiction, incarceration, unemployment, mental health, and all of those have numbers connected. So then those children who experience trauma become 
really valuable targets for these interventions because you can say intervene with one intervention and say you're going to take profit across all of these other future projected traumas that these kids are going to be fed into like before it even happens to them but you can say like clearly we know so you the profit taking potential is magnified and and oh gosh i think it's nadine burke harris is the the doctor that that Newsom appointed is the ACEs expert. And a lot of this is backed by the tech folks. She's gone over to Scotland and Scotland is like the first ACEs aware nation. And, and so they're being set up. Um, they pushed back in Scotland that they were going to have a, a minder for the children, that at birth children were gonna be assigned a minder that wasn't their family, that, that would oversee their well-being um, and, and monitor like in their homes um, these families and they were pushing all of the social emotional learning and profiling um, in ways that within these markets it wasn't about protecting kids it was actually about like managing families and managing this data and trauma for these capital markets in ways that were really really dark um, and I, I wrote a big piece um, it, actually the other piece of the ACEs is there's a, a Dr. Laird in the UK who wrote the equation for depression, a return on investment about the impact of depression on underemployment or unemployment. And so they created that equation and they used it to scale the mental health provisions for the National Health Service in the UK. They used that justification of the offset of depression. But most of the therapy that was offered was just like digital cognitive based CBT therapy. It was not other types of therapy. It was only therapy that could deliver the data for the impact markets. So anyway, it's very broad, but I want to say that there are all of these equations, and many of these equations are coming out of very esteemed institutions, right? They're coming out of Columbia, they're coming out of University of Chicago, they're coming out of London School of Economics. They, they're, they're stamped with sort of the seal of approval of the elite, and that is the hegemonic structure. And the thing about these digital platforms is that like, there's quite a bit of research that indicates screen time has negative mental health impacts. I mean, I think many of us who are trying to like live in these Zoom worlds or like navigate this stuff are feeling like after eight weeks how draining it is to try to interface with people this way. It's it it has very significant negative impacts. So the idea that somehow we're going to like do education now online, like beyond the data mining and the surveillance piece, is like the mental health piece. You know, I, I'm, I'm worried that actually what is happening now, because we're hearing a lot about like, oh, we need a lot more mental health in schools coming back because the kids are all traumatized. And like, it sounds like being in schools will be really traumatizing, um, is that Obama gutted FERPA, which is the, the, the um, it's like HIPAA, the health privacy protections for educational records. So when these services are delivered in a school-based setting, actually this much less rigorous protections are in place. HIPAA does not apply in school-based settings. So we're looking at like under the framing of community schools and community health centers based in schools that it, it puts students in a position of having data collected on them, potentially mental health data that could be very problematic in ways that is much less protected and could potentially be used to profile them into interventions. I think there are questions about if not only with mental health but other like wraparound service interventions that are proposed for families, if families decline, will that put them at risk of social service intervention? If, if they're, um, you know, what we're looking at now is um, there's a company called Achille that's developed like the first ADHD prescription video game treatment like so big pharma is getting into prescription video gaming. So like what if you have a kid who's stuck in, on devices in a school and is unhappy and, and then the school says, well, we think your child has ADHD. We've screened them into this intervention. You need to log them into Achille, you know, to do this prescription executive function training video game um, on, you know, or else you, you know, you can't be in the school. And if the parents refuse these interventions, which are increasingly the line between mental health interventions and academic are blurring through these digital technologies, like, do you, can you say no? <laughs> and like, who's investing in this stuff? It's these venture capital monsters, you know, who essentially create, break people to fix them, to make money, to break them again, to fix them. Like that's the cycle we're in. Mm -hmm.